The Nigerian economy is one of the largest in Africa, but a recession and an over-reliance on oil revenues has seen the country's finances dwindle. In 2020, Nigeria experienced its deepest recession in two decades. But growth in resumed last year as pandemic restrictions were eased and authorities implemented policies to counter the economic shock. But the International Monetary Fund has again raised concerns, saying the country faces significant risks from the pandemic trajectory, oil price uncertainty and security challenges. So how can Nigeria raise its 90 million people out of poverty and revitalize its economy? Well, joining me from Lagos for more on this is Nigeria's former finance minister, Dr. Kalu Idika Kalu. Good to see you again, Dr. Kalu. Thank you very much. My yes. pleasure. Yeah. And um, let's start from um, the fuel crisis we have in the country. How have you been faring in Lagos in the midst of... Uh, this issue of uh, contaminated fuel and all of that, a lot of Nigerians are back on the streets suffering from what ordinarily shouldn't have happened. Is, isn't government failing in its responsibility to its citizens on basic issues like fuel? How could Nigerians actually go to filling stations to actually buy fuel and then be buying contaminated fuel that affects their engines, knocking them down and all of that? What sort of trouble are we in? Well, from every angle you can look at it, I must say this is a crying shame. Uh, you ask me how we are coping, I'm staying in my house, but probably I can afford that. I still have a little fuel in my car and uh, have to measure where I go. But clearly, we've been on this for over three decades or more. We've been producing oil for over half a century. Um, to even imagine that we are not able to produce enough for ourselves, that's a major problem. To imagine that our prices are not uh, uh, in, in concert with what should be marketable prices where we have to uh, play in so much subsidies to even ensure that we have enough supplies is another big problem. The fact that we are not even exporting, this is a major resource. Our oil and gas sector should be earning us loss of revenues. But uh, lately, it looks like we are not even able to meet our quota. So we don't have to be too harsh if we say that somewhere along the line we have not uh, done what we should have done. Um, several years ago, of course, one took a look at this problem at the request of government. We had agreed at that time to recommend that we should build uh, what you call three new greenfields. These are brand new refineries. So this whole question of uh, management and uh, refurbishing and so on and so forth and all the associated costs are put behind us we are to build new refineries, we are to privatize existing refineries. Privatizing means instead of government spending money, the private sector takes it over at an agreed price and they then take care of whatever they will need to make sure they refurbish and put it back to full production. This is how they can earn their money back. We also had thought we should also be operating by now, this is over six years ago, by now we should have built several uh, medium-sized refineries all over the country so that as a nation that's producing, we're among the top seven producers in the world, there should be no question that we are not able to produce enough at affordable prices. And then you go to the area of uh, alternative things, you know, by the time you adjust prices, you are, you are providing alternative transport for different income levels, trains, buses, waterways, and so on and so forth. As somebody who was intimately involved with the mass transit program, this was our, our projection that by now we have a wide gauge going from Lagos all the way to Calabar, another one going from Lagos all the way to Bornu through the Zambiza forest and all that area would have opened up all this place in the early 90s. Well, it's no use looking back on those uh, policies that were not really fully implemented. But right now, I think the question is, how do we ensure adequate flow? We have to go back as much as possible, taking account of all the legal problems to ensure that we reprivatize our domestic uh, refineries, that we're able to move our exchange rates. It's a, a crying shame that we have to spend that kind of money. There is no way we can rationalize it. First of all, 
uh, when you listen to the analysis lately, it's very uh, disturbing that after over 30 years, we don't seem to get to the crux of the problem. The crux of the problem is the differential between what prices we have here and the prices just across our border, whether in the Cameroons or in Niger Republic or in uh, Benin ben ben Republic. Once that differential is, say, above uh, 2 and a half, 3%, there is very little you can do to prevent the products from moving back and forth. People will want to export it for profit. That is just the normal thing, and it's not a function of just greedy Nigerians. All, all exporters or importers will do the same thing when you have that kind of price differential. So the first thing we have to do, we cannot look as if we are totally uh, in a hopeless situation. We have to make sure that we, we, we narrow that differential to a manageable level where even after you add up the transport costs and other uh, tariffs and, and taxes and so on, the differential is two and a half at the most or three percent at the most. But where you have the thing being up to three times, four times the domestic price, that is why it will be smuggled out. Uh, therefore, one thing we can be doing now is to the central bank and all other monetary authorities that have anything to do with impacting the exchange rate, we have to take measures, macro and micro policies that will narrow the exchange rate, the differential between that exchange rate and the market rate. That will naturally, automatically narrow the differentials between domestic oil price and the border price of fuel. Now, subsidies are used by just about every client. Some have a lot of it, some use a little bit. So it can be used as a positive, positive step positive uh, instrument to, to meet the needs of the poorer segments of the population, whether it's subsidizing transportation, even to the point of even subsidizing some credit to farmers or subsidizing um, uh, communication, subsidizing some food in some way. I'm just listing this out. The question is now, how do you put the, the precise instrumentalities that you want to subsidize? And this is only for a short period to mitigate the differentials in what the market situation will give you if you just allow the market system to do it. But by and large, the tendency is to move the domestic prices to external market prices so that these things are uh, uh, seamlessly adjusted, just like you have uh, other products adjusting in the marketplace. So that is one thing I expect to see a lot more analysis and discussion about. Um, secondly, as I said, okay. there is no reason why we should not be producing our own fuel by any long shot. It is intolerable to imagine that we have four refineries and all of them are shut down. That, that, is, that is very disgraceful and I really don't know how we got there. And uh, thirdly, as an oil producing country and we are earning revenue from other sources and we can complement our earnings by efficient borrowing to make sure we have capacity to use our gas, to use our oil, to produce all these other byproducts, as was originally intended. So for us to be talking about monoculture or uh, exports being narrowed to oil and this, that just shows we've not performed. We should be exporting so many things, and we are doing so. The point is that the, the quantities are still so small because we've not expanded capacity, we've not trained enough people, we've not invested enough in all these other non-oil export systems. We should be exporting canned food, we should be exporting fresh food, among other things. I mean, uh, Nigeria can never be described as a money economy. Way back 50 years ago, of course, we were exporting beef minerals, we were exporting uh, cocoa, palm oil, and the rest of it. And for those even, you needed to go through various stages of valorization to add value, to make them to the kind of high export earnings that uh, we have seen has, hap uh, has happened in uh, Malaysia, Indonesia, and so on and so forth. But uh, if, if you look at the proposed Dangote refinery that will be coming on stream any, any moment from June, July this year, don't you think that will help to uh, um, reduce the importation that we have and boost uh, the forex uh, income of, of the country? And then uh, secondly, with the oil price inching closer to $90 and hopefully maybe it will get to $100 at the end of this month. Don't you think it's an opportunity for the Nigerian government to actually rethink how they can get at least a medium term strategy that will help to reduce these issues that we have in our oil industry? 
Well, that's the very essence of planning. We should not be waiting for Dangote refinery. That should have fitted into the medium term planning. We should have had uh, refineries operating while waiting for the Dangote. We should add a sizable proportion to the quantities available. But as I said, we cannot uh, do this on, in theory on air. This is what is in the planning. You, that's why we recommended privatizing. So those ones may not necessarily go out of production. We recommended new refineries, three of them, not just a Dangote. Dangote was just one, but there should have been one in Bielsa and possibly in Kogi. Nothing sacrosanct about those uh, locations. But the idea was that we should be building new refineries. We have the wherewithal to mobilize the resources long term, 10 year, 15 year money to make sure that we kept the capacity. That is how you, you, you put the planning. You don't have a hiatus in which you are waiting two, three years for one particular plant to get into production. So yes, that should help. But uh, the, there is no excuse for this situation where we find ourselves. It is un unthinkable that oil prices are going up and we are even earning less because we are not able to produce our quota. Uh, you've seen the horrid pictures about uh, crude refineries all over uh, the riverine areas. Those things should have been monitored. In any case, that was the case where all these extra crews should have been going to medium-sized refineries or whatever you, refer you call them, all over the country where we are waiting for the big major ones because as a major producer, it's not just for our own domestic market. We should be exporting to the regions and beyond. That was the whole idea. So yes, yes, that should amenorate, but there will be no way to explain the higher thoughts that we are having now, where people are hoarding in anticipation of higher prices and so on and so forth. Those should, things should not happen because there should be enough competition within the subsector that nobody can afford to, to hoard without losing money. So this is what is amenable to planning. That's what we should have been doing. So should Nigeria sell all its um, refineries, the public refineries at the moment? Would you subscribe to that idea that they are scrap right now? There's no reason why we should continue paying the refinery staff who are not mm. producing anything and we should just sell all of them at the moment and see how we can draw more private capital into investing mm. in, uh, uh, into the new refineries that you were talking about. Well, to a small extent, this is a political decision. But primarily, countries that are up to it in terms of optimal policies know that this is not a matter of whether we like to or we don't like to. We should have done this at a time when those refineries were still producing. That was what we advised about six, seven years ago. You don't wait until they become scrap before you do so. We should let the experts within the sector guide and we had them, we have them, we are not short of experts within the industry and outside the industry. More and more, we should be guided by the views of these experts as for the timing and the structure of the industry. How much should we, uh, in fact, first of all, the question of producing or exporting crude should have been out of the system for at least 15 years now or more. There is no way we should have still been producing uh, crude. I mean, exporting crude, we should produce it and we should export it and we should be going to all the aromatics and all these other uh, byproducts of the sector. This is the whole essence of an oil sector that now uh, results in developing agriculture and uh, other <laughs> industries. That is the essence of having a diversified uh, product mix. And Nigeria had one of the most diversified product mix. There's no way we can blame our natural endowment for the narrowness of our resource base right now, in effect. All right, so we should have done that long time ago. But it's never, too, it's never too late to do it anywhere. There are takers there. If you've run down your refinery, they should be open bidding by those who can immediately, in an attempt to recover their money, you don't have to push them. You have, don't have to monitor them. They know it's in their own best short and medium term interest to make it start to work and so on. And you recoup with uh, whatever fiscal measures you put in place. So instead of paying in money, now begin to draw in money. And then the new ones, of course, will be, uh, we make sure that the best investors, they built the up-to-date uh, technologies and they're able to produce maximally. So Nigeria should be in a much, much better place. There's no question about that. Okay, very interesting indeed, Dr. Carlo. I'll just ask you to hold on. And when we come back from this short break, we'll be talking about renewable energies, talking about the impact of COVID. And then, of course, the constant turnaround maintenance by the Nigerian government on this. Uh, refineries that are not producing anything. You're still watching the Arise interview. Plenty more still ahead. Stay with us.
Welcome back to the Arise interview. I'm Somna Sambo. Nigeria's economy is recovering from a historic downturn due to government policy support, rising oil prices and international financial assistance. Despite this recovery, socio-economic challenges remain. Levels of food insecurity have risen and the poverty rate is estimated to have risen during the pandemic. Experts say the country needs to turn its attention away from maximizing revenues from oil to maximizing people's opportunities. And former Finance Minister Dr. Kalu, Dike Kalu, is still uh, with me from Lagos. Uh, Dr. Kalu, let's, let's take a look at how uh, poorer a lot of Nigerians have become because of this uh, COVID-19 pandemic, which has seen a lot of people, uh, you know, finding it very difficult to survive and then um, struggling. We've seen even the government itself struggling to get revenues and all of that. What impact do you think this has had on the Nigerian economy, considering that uh, the World Bank is saying that we're going to have a 2.5 percent economic growth in 2022? Do you believe this 2.5 percent is actually realistic based on all these issues? Well, all these uh, percentage growths, if you consider that our population is probably growing about that rate, that means that even if you are to grow at 2.5%, you are probably just sustaining the level of poverty at where they are. But you are tr thinking of growing faster. So you are actually raising more people from uh, below poverty to above poverty. Now, the next point I want to make is that it's not a, a question of economic statistics. The issue of security, we know what's been happening, particularly in the Northeast, all that area where we had accumulation of uh, people who've been uh, forced to leave their earnings on the farms, in other professions, and so on and so forth. You have the same thing now in many parts of the country where people have had to abandon their farms and so on and so forth. So alongside the economic indicators is the overriding issue of security. Uh, we've been told that government is doing its best and they've made some leeway, but of course the citizens want to see more striking uh, reversal of this insecurity. As long as there's significant insecurity, even the optimal cannot be attained in terms of providing the other means of income for these poorer uh, members of the population. Secondly, as you were just mentioning, if the oil price is increasing, we should be the ones as if we are laughing to the bank because we, are, we should be a producer. But now <laughs> we are even hearing it that uh, OPEC is amazed how we are unable to meet our quota, is it 1.7 or 2 million barrels a day? That is unconscionable. We should be pushing beyond the OPEC quota because we have so much capacity that we have that is not being utilized. And on top of it, you know there has been a lot of disruptions of the oil industry. That's also adding a negative element to the uh, source of income as well as income earnings by those who are in this sector. You only need to have uh, looked at the pictures from the riverine areas where they were destroying all kinds of, uh, 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 you know, backward uh, refineries or whatever they call them over there. So I think there are a whole multiple of issues that we have to face simultaneously. It's never always this or that. You have to face all these issues simultaneously. The issue of power, for instance. Some people are being hampered by power supply. Uh, well, some of us who had direct input into the theory about this privatization, the idea was that whether it is refineries or power, first, government has to recover maximally everything it had put in. Secondly, government has to give it to people who understand, who have experience in these industries. You don't just sell it to anybody. And to anybody means you are moving those sectors into the global economy, at least on a temporary basis, six, seven, eight, ten years. I, I want so to the, just the cut in. From anywhere. Sorry, I just have yes. to cut you in here and come to that COVID issue. Because I, I remember you talking yes, about sir. how uh, okay. dissatisfied you were with uh, the hungry crowds that are restive, taking matters into their own hands. How alarmed are you as an elite that, uh, you know, there are lots of many hungry Nigerians on the streets? Well, I don't know about being elite. I think any Nigerian should be very concerned. And every person who is in charge of peace and security has to be very concerned. When people are openly gathering, they, they are hungry when they are hungry. To that extent, they are not quite as rational as you might think 
whether you have a policeman holding guns around them, they are hungry. They break into offices, they break into stores, they go there not just to steal food, they will go and steal typewriters and uh, computers, anything they can get their hands on, hoping to convert into money, into food that they can now use. So those signals should be as much concern to anybody, whatever your income grade, because when those crowds begin to now invade uh, vicinities, in the inner city, in the suburbs, in the uh, villages, on the urban areas, they are not... They are not going to spare anybody because you are well-dressed or you are riding a good car. So government has to monitor this. When we say government, we are not talking about just federal government. That is, the, the local government, in fact, should be aware. The police should be aware in their various formations. The, the, the state government should be aware. So, as I said... So what should the Buhari admin... weeks ago, in fact... It's okay, so what should the Buhari administration well, be I'm doing going to address as it that wraps issue. up? Yes. Well, I... Okay, I think that, um, as I said, I think it was on this same uh, station, every country, no matter what it is, you deliberately call in the various arms of the government, the private sector, the NGOs, you set up some kind of a reliable medium of, of getting pilots to various sections of the population. You don't put a few uh, rice bags on a, a pickup truck and you drive into my seven and you are tossing it at a crowd of men, women, and children. This has to be planned so that people have some expectation that at least they will get something. That immediately assuages this tendency for people to just take loss into their own hands. I know that I, I don't have enough information on what the palliative system has been. We are very proud of what our doctors have done to stem the spread of COVID and to monitor all the, uh, all the variations that have since come up. They've done very well medically. But I think government, as I said, government in the broadest sense needs to make sure that people don't go to get to the point where they are desperate, where they don't know where the, the next half cup of rice will come from, where they don't know how they can get water, how they can get yams or rice. Uh, as all right. So we must thank Governments you. can meet. Sector, the palliative system should be clear or, and or, unambiguous. Or, so I think we need to hear that more is being done. But as I say, with all due respect, I could be accused of not being up to date on exactly what is happening. But from the pictures we see, it looks like we are entering a new phase. If we don't do something within the next few weeks, it's going to get worse, where people are just marauding all over the place. We must it's not thank going to you. be just in the northeast. We, we must thank everywhere. you so much, uh, Dr. Kalu Dikakalu, former finance minister, for joining us to take a critical look at these issues and what the government needs to do urgently uh, based on this um, uh, uh, alarm that you've raised on how more people are becoming hungry every day on the streets of Nigeria. We must thank you for joining us on the show. Uh, well, that's how it's been for this edition of the Arising TV. Do join us again tomorrow from me and the entire team here in Abuja. Goodbye and thank you for watching. I'm Somna Sandu.